My name is Amy Lizer, and I'm the Executive Director of the Monroe County Historical Association, and I'd like to welcome you to our September 3rd Thursday Lecture Series. I am very excited to learn tonight uh, with John Abel, who's going to present uh, the story of Horatio Howell, a Water Gap minister. Uh, as most of you know, the Stroud Mansion is currently under renovation. Uh, so the building is closed. So we have taken this program on the road. And uh, when John said he wanted to do a program on a Water Gap minister who happened to preach in this church, oh, that's a perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really great. Um, it, this was just a natural spot. So I think it's really, really neat that we're going to learn about the minister that stood at this podium and will be speaking with you. Um, John is a wonderful volunteer with the Historical Association. He is a former board member and he currently chairs the History Committee. So if we could please give a warm welcome to John Abel. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for that introduction and I thank all of you guys for coming out tonight uh, and giving me this opportunity to uh, speak and to introduce uh, my new book, um, Silent Legacy. Uh, this is the story of the Reverend Horatio Howe, uh, a minister from here in Delaware Water Gap who enlisted in the Union Army uh, in 1862, was assigned to the 90th Pennsylvania Regiment um, as their chaplain, and was killed at the Battle of Gettysburg in July of 1863. This is a story of forgiveness, uh, and reconciliation, and it is told um, through the conversations uh, and the interactions of men uh, from his regiment that get together at the 50th reunion in 1913 of the Battle of Gettysburg. The, uh, the title, uh, Silent Legacies, is derived uh, from a series of letters that go back and forth between some of the soldiers and their sweethearts uh, and that element of the story uh, will become more clearly defined uh, as you read the book. How subtle was that? <laughs> <laughs> now, I say, I, I say uh, this is my new book because um, uh, back in 2019, uh, this book, the first book I wrote, The Murder of Theodore Broadhead, was published, and this story takes place right here uh, in Delaware Water Gap. Uh, I'm happy to say that um, there is still a considerable amount of interest uh, in this story, and um, this book is uh, still actually selling, uh, selling fairly well. I also want to again acknowledge the artistic abilities of my wife, Beverly. Uh, she created this exceptional artwork that is the cover of both my books, um, and um, I, she always does a really great job of painting these covers for me. Um, in today's world, uh, with self-publishing and print-on-demand capabilities, uh, it is estimated that more than a million new books uh, come to the marketplace every year. So the writer has to have something to entice the reader to pick up his book. Uh, that's why uh, cover art is so important. That's what cover art uh, is supposed to do. It is wonderful. Uh, that so many people have the opportunity uh, to publish their own book. The only downside to that is that so many people have the opportunity to publish their <laughs> own book. So it, it, it is a crowded market. Um, but, to, but to compete in that world, uh, we need to have good covers and covers that, uh, to gain, it, that gain attention, and uh, I think my wife Beverly has that covered. Um, what's written on the back of a book uh, is called back cover copy, and it too is very important. The front cover gets the reader to pick the book up, the back cover copy gets the reader to buy the book. Uh, back cover copy should only be 250 to 300 words, uh, and it should summarize the storyline, and I have added uh, maybe one or two questions there to entice the reader to want to find out more about what's happening in the story. Uh, people that know book marketing well uh, always say that you should put a little something about yourself uh, on the back cover, um, something uh, interesting, and maybe even something a little personal 
uh, about yourself so that people will know that you're not just a history geek, which I didn't know was a bad thing. But this is Horatio Stockton Howe. Uh, Reverend Howe is not the protagonist of this book. That is to say that Reverend Howe is not the main character of the book. He is, however, the catalyst for this story. He lived an exemplary life, and um, reconciliation flows through his legacy, and this book makes every effort to show the importance uh, of forgiveness and reconciliation. This is a book, this is a work of historical fiction, uh, meaning that it is based in fact, meaning that it takes place at a particular uh, time in history, and that it is also, and that it occurs in a culturally recognizable uh, time. There is a historical uh, fiction uh, novel society, and they have set up several guidelines to be followed. If you want your book to be uh, considered in the genre of historical fiction, and you're expected to follow these guidelines. One is major characters are to be factual, and that would, of course, be pretty important. Any major character in your book should be presented factually, even if that major character is a fictional person, he is to be presented factually. Period details are to be accurate, that is to say, what did people wear, what did people eat, uh, what were the uh, conveyances they used to get from place to place, uh, those kinds of period details are to be presented accurately. The society wants uh, at least 50 years between the date of the event you're writing about and the date of publication of your story. That is because it's, it's deemed important that the author be writing from research uh, and not from uh, uh, personal experience. There can be some fictionalization, there can be some dramatization, that's fine, and the outcome uh, is not to be altered. As I did not alter the outcome of the story, one always needs to remember that the outcome of the story is one thing, uh, and the end of the book uh, is another thing. Recently, I uh, had an opportunity to talk to some young people about guidelines for writing, um, and I had to think of myself uh, so many years ago as a young person in senior English class, and we were reading um, W. Somerset Maugham's Of Human Bondage. And I can remember sitting in that class thinking, this is dreadful. This is just a dreadful story. And I thought, if I ever write a book, I hope it will not be sound like W. Somerset Maugham. Recently, it came to my attention, someone told me that it was W. Somerset Maugham who said, there are three rules for writing a great novel. And fortunately, no one knows what they are. So then I thought, you know what, maybe he wasn't such a bad guy after all. Uh, folks hold a variety of opinions um, about, uh, about historical fiction. There are folks who uh, love to read fiction, but they hate history. And there are folks who love history and don't want any make-believe mixed in uh, with their history. So there are limitations uh, to the popularity of the genre. Um, but here are, some, here are some examples of historical fiction. Um, that we, and these are important books by important authors. The Hunchback of Notre Dame by Victor Hugo, uh, Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell, uh, The Killer Angels by uh, Michael Chirra, that's all historical fiction. And that list could go on and on. Um, the Three Musketeers, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, A Tale of Two Cities, The Last of the Mohicans, the list can go on and on. Historical fiction is just a, it's just a great genre. Once I decided to write this book, or once anybody decides to write a book, they need to have a point of view. The point of view is very important in that the point of view determines how and who will tell the story. Now, my point of view that I often use is the third person. So I write in the third person, so I will always use pronouns like he, him, she, her, they, them. These are small words that take the place of a noun. And obviously, becoming, from what I see in the news, are becoming more and more important every day. And nowadays, if you don't like your pronoun, you can just simply change it, it seems. So also, I write um, from the position of um, omniscient narrator. 
That means this, that means I know what has happened, I know what is going to happen, and I know what will happen. I control all the elements in the story. I can take a plot or a scene um, and make it as complex or as simple as I, as I want to make it. Um, I also have complete uh, flexibility as it relates to the timeline of the story. Uh, I could start right in the beginning and just go through to the end, that would be linear, or I could start anywhere on the timeline um, and go back and forth and use memories and recollections and backstory and, and, move, the, and move the story back and forth. That's how I wrote the uh, Silent Legacy. Um, I think it's more interesting and it makes for a more pleasant read. Um, there, are, there are as many styles um, of writing as there are people who write, but basically there are two um, writing personalities. Uh, one is the plotster and uh, one is the hamster. And the plotster, of course, plots. Uh, he outlines, um, uh, he describes his characters, he builds his characters, uh, he puts them in families, uh, he gives them characteristics, he gives them psychological dynamics, and he knows what they will do, and he knows what they are doing, and he knows what they are going to do. Um, recently, a friend of mine who writes said to me that in her new book that, that she is working on, one of the characters in her book did something that was totally out of the character and really did surprise her. Well, I just I really can't imagine how a character in your book did something that you didn't make that character do. But that's a very different style of writing. And the pansters are the people who fly by the seat of their pants. And that style of writing works very well for some people. Um, it does not work for me, but it does work well for some people. And I must say, there is a certain element of uh, freshness and freedom and a spontaneity to that kind of writing that you don't always find with somebody who just kind of plots and plods along. Um, when Margaret Mitchell wrote Gone with the Wind, uh, she wrote the last chapter first, uh, and then she wrote all the intervening chapters, and in no particular order. And that only took her three years. Then she spent the next seven years editing, writing, and rewriting and putting the book into the format and into the, uh, into the style uh, that the book has come to us today. That took her seven years. It took me four years uh, to write Silent Legacies. Uh, that was about two years uh, of research and about two years of, of writing um, and rewriting. And when writers talk about the work of research, re research is work. Uh, I'm not talking about digging a ditch or putting a roof on a house, not that kind of work. But, but researching is work in that it's time consuming and it's demanding of your uh, uh, constant attention. Um, uh, but it's, it's that knowledge gathering function that makes the book, that makes the book possible. So the, so the research has to be done. The research for this book, Time of Legacy, really was uh, enjoyable. Um, I visited um, many websites, I uh, read countless newspaper articles and books and brochures uh, about the Battle uh, of Gettysburg uh, and, about the, um, and about the reunion of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, I communicated with uh, many different historical societies. Um, I learned all about Horatio Howe and I was very fortunate in that I got to sit down more than once with a direct descendant of Horatio Howe, and she was uh, uh, very gracious and uh, provided me with a lot of um, uh, information about the family and, and about Horatio Howe. Um, I learned an awful lot about the village of Delaware Water Gap, even though I did live here once upon a time. Um, I learned an awful lot about the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg, and most fascinating of all, I learned a lot about the 50th reunion uh, of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, it was held on the battlefield July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, uh, 1913, um, and is sometimes referred to as the Reconciliation Reunion. Now, here we see a group of soldiers standing at a place called the Angle by the Copse of Trees. They're standing there, this is, a, this is where Pickett's Charge was, and they're standing there 50 years, almost to the hour, 
after they met there 50 years earlier and so valiantly tried to kill each other. So uh, there they are. All of these men now would be in their mid to late 70s. Um, that was Pickett's Charge. And if you look at Pickett's Charge today, you will often find it referred to as the Pickett, Pettigrew, and Trimble Charge, which really doesn't roll off the tongue as well. But that's what, what it's referred to, because those were the three division commanders in charge, in charge of that charge which was, of course, a cataclysmic failure for the South. George Pickett bore the responsibility for that failure pretty much by himself all his life. Uh, at the end of his life, he died in 1888. At the end of his life, he was interviewed by a young journalist, and the journalist asked General Pickett if there was any one particular element uh, that, he could, um, that he could point to and say, this was the cause of, of our problems uh, uh, on, on July the 3rd. And George Pickett thought for a second and then he said, I always thought the Yankees had something to do with it. So, <laughs> so, he, so he was a man who was a man of good character and a man of a, a good sense of humor. Here we see a, a group of um, 24 former combatants breaking bread together Tables like this were set up uh, throughout the great camp, um, and uh, this is where the men took their meals. There isn't exactly anything historically earth-shattering about watching some old, old soldiers eat, but there is, um, if, you, if you look at that photo, you'll see some similarities there. Um, these men are um, all wearing hats. Uh, most of them have their tie buttoned up at the collar. Uh, some of them have on jackets and vests. Um, the weather on the, uh, in July of 1913 was pretty much the same as it was in July 1863. It was over 90 degrees and it was extremely humid. So these people are very uncomfortable, but they're still dressed and they still look nice uh, in public. Now, this is the great camp. There were over 5,000 tents set up to accommodate more than 55,000 soldiers uh, that came. And this uh, occupied more than 250 acres of battlefield uh, at Gettysburg. Uh, and the tents were all clustered uh, by state. And that was a, a decision made by the committee. And there was a committee. This thing was in the planning stages for more than eight years. And the committee deemed it necessary uh, to keep the states clustered by, keep the tents clustered by state because they were afraid that some of these old war horses would get out in the hot sun and might want to give it another try. But uh, everything was peaceful and it, and, um, and it went by okay without any, without any fights. Now, we do know uh, that support uh, for Lincoln and the Civil War in general was not exactly overwhelming uh, here in Monroe County. Uh, but. Uh, there, were, uh, there were men who served, there were men who, um, who fought at Gettysburg, so consequently there were men who went to, uh, to Gettysburg for the 50th reunion. And here is an article uh, from the Monroe Record, dated June 26, 1913, titled, uh, Going to Gettysburg. And I can't see that. It's, it's, it's just that a large number of veterans uh, from the town and the area uh, went to Gettysburg. It says they left on the Pennsylvania Railroad. That would have been in East Stroudsburg. Uh, and then he, uh, on Monday, some left Saturday, Sunday, some left Monday. Uh, and then he gives us some names that we actually would still recognize today. Um, uh, Schoonover, Abram Road, uh, there's a Yetter uh, on that train, and William Walton. And I believe William Walton is the, is the man whose uh, Civil War letters home uh, have been saved and uh, compiled into a, into a book, and it's a lovely read. Um, and then, let's see, we have, here we have another article uh, from the uh, Monroe Record dated July the 3rd, 1913, uh, titled Soldiers to Gettysburg. It's a little bit redundant. He says, he tells us pretty much the same thing, uh, and this time he names more pe people that go, and once again, uh, we see names we recognize, the few, uh, Garris, Flory, uh, and Disney. So those are all those are all names that are familiar to us, and those are men who went to Gettysburg. Now, just to make sure that we have a well-rounded 
uh, uh, view of this situation. We have a last article that, uh, from the Monterey Record from uh, July the 10th, 1913. Uh, local soldiers condemned big camp. So not everybody was too delighted with the accommodations. A gentleman named uh, Abram Rhodes uh, wasn't happy, it was too hot, and he complained that he couldn't get a blanket. I don't quite understand if you're too hot why you need a blanket, but whatever. <laughs> um, he wasn't happy with the food, and uh, more men came that could be, a, that could be accommodated. That was true. Uh, the, the response to this, uh, to this um, uh, reunion was, was overwhelming. Um, so so uh, uh, Abram Rhodes um, took, a, uh, took some men and they just got back on the train and they just uh, came back to Stroudsburg after one day. In all my research, it's the only complaint I ever, I, I ever came across. And here we have uh, a, group of, uh, a group photo of 22 uh, Civil War veterans from our area. Uh, they have gathered in front of Nice's restaurant in Stroudsburg, which at the time uh, was located up on um, 6th Street on Quaker Alley uh, because the Stroud Cinema was there. And we know that you can pick up right in the middle of that photo is the number 18. That was their address, the address of Nice's restaurant. Um, in 1916. This photo was from 1916, not 1913. So it's just a couple of years later that they all got together um, uh, for, for a photo. But once again, you see the similarity. The, the, the beards are neatly trimmed. Uh, everybody has on a, a heavy woolen uh, suit. Uh, collars are buttoned, the ties are in place. Um, so that's, so that's, uh, that's, how they, uh, that, that's how they look. Uh, like that in 1916. Um, this is titled a, uh, <coughs> Horatio Howe went to Lafayette College in Egypt, and this is titled a brief biographical sketch um, of the alumni of Lafayette College. So above and below Horatio Howe's name would have been listed dozens and dozens of other men that went to Lafayette. Um, this was, this was published uh, in 1879 by the Alumni Association of Lafayette College, and this was given to me by the, uh, by the uh, librarian uh, at, at Lafayette College, who was very helpful to me. So anyway, here we see Horatio Howe, Howe his name. Uh, he was enrolled 1835 to 36. He received an AM, which is a master's degree. Uh, he was born in Ewing, New Jersey in August of 1820. Epps tells us that he was a member of the Franklin uh, Literary Society, which was a debating club uh, on, the co on the campus at Lafayette. UTS tells us that he went to Union Theological Seminary in New York City from 42 to 45. He was ordained a Presbyterian minister in Philadelphia in 1846, posted to East Whiteland, Pennsylvania, 46 to 49, Elkton, Maryland, 49 to 53, Delaware Watergate, 53 to 61, chaplain to the 90th Pennsylvania Regiment, 61 to 63, killed in action in Gettysburg, July the 1st, 1863. I don't know where that 1861, this is the only document I can find that says 1861. All the others say 1862. So going forward, I'm going to say 1862. Uh, 1846 was a pretty busy year for the young Horatio Howell. Um, he was ordained that year. Uh, he got married that year to a girl named uh, Isabella Grant, and he was assigned to his first church in East Whiteland, Pennsylvania. I cannot find a town called East Whiteland, Pennsylvania, but southwest of Philadelphia is a rather large township called East Whiteland Township, so I'm assuming that's the area he was in. In 1848, he is posted to a larger church in Elkton, Maryland, and when he gets to Elkton, Maryland, Horatio Howe sees, uh, for the first time, he sees slavery at work, and he is repulsed by slavery. And we know that because of something that he wrote, which was in his papers. Um, and this is from his own hand. I am convinced that this institution of slavery will reduce to the condition of brutes, those whom God created in his own image and for whom Christ has died. From that sentence, we get ourselves a really good look into the character of the minister, Horatio Howe. 
while he's in Elton, Maryland, he also um, runs into and meets a, a, a fiery uh, older man who is a minister and is known for delivering sermons uh, against slavery and sermons uh, against secession. Uh, he becomes a mentor to Hal, and Hal is very much um, uh, influenced by this minister named James Wilton. He is influenced because, because when Hal's second son is born, they name the child James Wilson Howell. So, in 1853, Howell is posted to Delaware Water Deck, and then in 1862, he joins the Union Army. I believe that the Reverend Howe was sent to Delaware Water Gap because the senior management uh, of the Presbyterian Church realized that they had a very, very capable young man here. So he sent to Delaware Water Gap with the instructions to not only enlarge the flock of Presbyterians that are already here, but to actually build a brick and mortar church. This is the church that he built. It was opened and dedicated in 1854, which means that Howell got this church opened in one year. This picture is from, I think, 1887 or 1889, like that. Here is the uh, Presbyterian Church of the Mountain, as it looks today. This is the church we're sitting in. 169 years later, uh, still active, still vibrant. Um, and several members of this congregation I call my very good friend. Uh, also, this was the church of my wife's family. Um, and so, uh, in 1973, 50 years ago, pretty soon, um, we will uh, be married. And in 50 years ago, uh, we got married right here in this church. No, not by Reverend Hal. I can hear you thinking it. <laughs> I had, a, I had a speaking part that night, too, but it was very short. <laughs> Only had to say two words. I stood right there and said, I do. Not that. So, how Delaware Water Gap from 1853 to 1862, and in those nine years, um, he not only got this church built and uh, up and running, but he also built, uh, developed a curriculum and became the first principal of what became known as the classical school, and that building later became uh, the Glenwood Hotel. And in Casey Drake's wonderful book, Pahakaline, uh, Casey Drake tells us that there is a writing that says uh, of, the, of the classical school, many well-known and prominent people of the day were among its graduates. So I thought that was pretty, I thought that was pretty nice. Um, in early March, 1862, Reverend Howe says goodbye to his wife and his three children, uh, and he enlists in the Union Army. He is commissioned a lieutenant uh, in Chaplain Corps. Reverend Howe, now Chaplain Howe, uh, is assigned to the 90th Pennsylvania Regiment, which was recruited mostly out of Philadelphia. The chaplains were always assigned on a regimental level, and a regiment is um, 10 companies of 100 men. So Reverend Howe finds himself um, in charge, uh, responsible for the emotional and spiritual well-being uh, of, of a thousand souls. And chaplains in the Northern Army uh, took very good care of their soldiers. Uh, they dressed their wounds, uh, they comforted them as they died, they sealed their nerves for battle, uh, they read and wrote letters for them, and if a man was killed, they, they, they wrote a letter to that man's parents. Um, uh, the men loved their chaplains, uh, and Reverend Howe was much loved by the troops in the 90th Pennsylvania. That relationship between chaplain and soldier did not exist, not to that extent, uh, in, in the Confederate Army. The 90th uh, Pennsylvania was heavily engaged uh, throughout the Civil War, and so, skip one. The 90th Pennsylvania was heavily engaged throughout the Civil War, um, and so Chaplain Howe would have seen some real nasty fights before he was killed at Gettysburg. Um, he's only in the army for uh, four or five months and in August of 1862, he's at Second Bull Run. Uh, the very next month in September, uh, he's at Antietam, the, the bloodiest day of the, in the Civil War. December of 1862, he's at Fredericksburg and in April of 1863, he's at Chancellorsville. Less than uh, two months after they get to Chancellorsville, 
uh, the 90th arrived after, less than two months after they leave Chancellorsville. The 90th Pennsylvania arrived in Gettysburg. And on Wednesday, July 1st, 1863, on the steps of Christ Lutheran Church, uh, the Reverend Howie Scott killed. This is Christ Lutheran Church. Uh, early in the morning of the first day of the battle, July 1st, it was set up as a field hospital, and Hal was inside this church ministering to the wounded. Uh, planks were brought into the church and laid across the tops of the pews, and that is where the, the medical types would bring in the wounded soldiers and lay them on the tops of the pews. Uh, there were more than 150 uh, soldiers laying in this small church, all of them needing uh, medical attention. This window in the corner, this was called the surgeon's corner. This is where the surgeon performed his amputations. That window was knocked out and the body parts were thrown out that window until they reached the level uh, of that window and then they had to be raked away to make room for more. The, the American Civil War is a pretty nasty stuff. So, the rebels now are advancing down Chambersburg Street and overrunning the town of Gettysburg Horatio Howe says, while he's inside the church, Horatio Howe says, I will step outside and see what the commotion is. A young Confederate soldier sees Howe on the porch and calls for his surrender. But Howe won't surrender. Uh, instead, Howe launches into a um, erudite and lengthy speech about why the rules of war don't apply to him. Well, in the heat of battle and in the confusion of battle, and probably out of some fear for his own life, the Confederate soldier shot him. Uh, Howe fell dead right outside the door in between the two main columns, and you can see the pedestal on your left. Uh, the first thing is the parking meter. The second one is the pedestal, and uh, it's a memorial pedestal to Horatio Howe. This is a memorial pedestal to Horatio Howe. It was placed here um, on the exact spot where the rebels stood um, when, he, when he shot Horatio Howe. And it was placed there in 1893 uh, by the 90th Pennsylvania Survivors Association. So 30 years after the death of Howe, the men of the 90th Pennsylvania are still honoring him. So that speaks to that bond between chaplain uh, and soldier. <coughs> There are, there are several eyewitness accounts to the death of Chaplain Howe, um, and of course they all vary to some degree. Uh, but there was one man who was standing next to Howe when he was shot, and he wrote down what he saw. His name is Sergeant Archibald Snow, uh, and he was in the church having a wound dressed, having a wound to his arm dressed. He walked out with Howe, and, um, and he stood on the porch with Howe when Howe was shot. His report is not only verifiable, but his report is logical. I did not print the report in the book because I wanted to describe the death of Horatio Howe through dialogue, which is people talking, and always has more personal impact than simply narrative, which would just be you reading the report. You can look the report up online. It's only a paragraph long. In addition to Sergeant Snow, who would end up the, uh, who would end up the war major, uh, there is this book, The History of Monroe County During the Civil War by Leroy Jennings Cole, who was a professor of history uh, in the 1950s at the then East Stroudsburg State Teachers College. Cole writes this in his book. Due to the excess of heat, Reverend Howe reached in his pocket for a handkerchief, but the rebel misunderstood the gesture and killed him on the steps of the hospital. Now, I'm sure Professor Cole is a very fine historian. Um, and I used the blend of his account and, and, and uh, Snow's account uh, in the book. Uh, but I always wondered why Kohler always refers to Howe as Reverend Howe. He never calls him Chaplain Howe. He was Chaplain Howe when he was killed. Um, he always refers to the shooter as a hospital guard. H hospital guards were in the rear. This young man was an advanced skirmisher. These were the young guys on the front lines with the rifles. They were serious soldiers. They had one job, kill the enemy. I've always been surprised that when he saw Howe standing on the porch, he just didn't shoot him right then and there instead of demanding, instead of asking uh, for his surrender. Also, uh, he calls the church a hospital. When, when this church was first opened, it was called College Lutheran Church, then it became Christ Lutheran Church. 
But this church at 44 Chambersburg Street has never been anything but a church. It never was a hospital. So, and there we have it. Horatio Howe joins the army. Horatio Howe gets killed. So how am I going to take that basic, uh, unadorned historical fact and turn it into an interesting and enjoyable 50,000-word book uh, with an underlying theme of reconciliation? Well, I got the characters. Uh, I got the place. I got the time period. Um, I certainly have the event. And there are people who actually experienced um, and demonstrated reconciliation at the 1913 reunion. But there are many well-known and well-respected historians like Professor Carolyn Janey at the University of Virginia who do not believe that reconciliation ever took place. And Professor Janey may have a point. But if we don't look at nations, if we don't look at vast armies, but if we instead look at individuals, then we can see examples of reconciliation between between North and South soldiers. Um, and, I have, and I have counted, I have recounted some of them uh, in the story, in the book, but I have one that I would just like to read quickly. Now, here's the scene. There are three old Yankee soldiers and one rebel sitting on a park bench across the street from Christ Lutheran Church, so they're looking at the church. Up the street, <clears throat> up the street come uh, two soldiers, a Yank and a Red leaning on each other, walking with canes. It was a common sight in Gettysburg this reunion weekend to see Yanks and Rebs walking and talking cordially, and this particular pair brought no special attention upon themselves. Just before reaching the bench that held Old Reb and his new Yankee friends, they turned and entered the small shady grove of elms, evergreen, and burnt grass. They continued their private conversation loudly since neither could hear the other without shouting. It was right here, explained the Yank. Right here, I remember it well. I ran like that Dickens from that rock over there to that rock over there. He pointed with his right arm and his thin, high-pitched voice ratcheted up with every sentence. Three times you shot at me. Three times. The smile creased his wrinkled face. And you miss me every time. The rebel soldier stopped and let his weight shift to the cane held in his left hand. He used his right hand to thoughtfully stroke his white beard, then he spoke. I apologize, sir, for my poor marksmanship. They laughed, locked arms, and meandered off into the timelessness of history. <coughs> the story moves forward. It briefly touches on World War I, then it touches on World War II, and then it comes to rest outside Washington, D.C., post-Vietnam. The spirit of Chaplain Howe runs through the book as the spirit of reconciliation runs through it. Horatio Stockton Howe, a minister from Delaware Water Gap, this very church, a chaplain in the Union Army, a casualty of the Battle of Gettysburg, and a proud page in the history of Monroe County. And you guys have been great, and I thank you so much. I hope somebody asked me something. <laughs> Go ahead. Get, get. Where is he buried? Her, Horatio Stockton Howe was briefly buried right next to the church in, in that initial in that initial of trying to bury 7,000 people. Um, he was buried next to the church, but only for a few days. Then he was disinterred and taken to the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I think that the wife, the wife was from Brooklyn, New York, and so he is buried there in Brooklyn, New York. Greenwood Cemetery. Dave. John, the, the pictures you had of the Monroe County vets by that restaurant, are any of those individuals identified? Well, we, we had talked about that, and since we don't have their names, we don't know how to identify them. Okay. Can I go? Yeah. So unless someone comes forward and says, hey, that's my patty, I, I don't know how we will ever identify them. Yes, ma'am. What happened to his family? Well, that's a good question, and I really can't give you an answer. The wife died. His wife died about 20 years after him. So maybe the wife lived into the 1890s, I think. 
and the children um, had children, um, and I, 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 I just didn't include it. I did read it, uh, I did see it. They all survived to adulthood. There were three of them. There were three children, they survived to adulthood, and I just didn't include it because I just, it didn't become part of the book, so it didn't become part of the talk. But uh, his, children did, his children did survive and prosper. Yes, there were three of them. Yes, Amy? Wasn't there talk that he wasn't in um, chaplain attire? Well, that's probably what got him killed, besides his mouth. <laughs> and I think, you know, really, after doing so much research and so much writing about the guy, you get to feel like you know the guy. And I think, I think I like the guy. I think I have some respect for the guy. But I also think there was some vanity there. Horatio Howe did not wear uh, the uniform of, of the chaplaincy corps. He wore a standard battle um, uh, jacket. He also was very fond of wearing a dress sword and a side arm. So, so when you step out into the porch in the middle of a battle with a sword and a side arm, your chances of getting a shot go, pr go up pretty quickly. But yet, but yeah, he did it. Um, he, he did it. He did not wear the chaplain's uniform. Then that was that was one of the things that across the street. There, there are several stories that go along with this. Across the street at a store, people were standing on the porch. Well, that's nonsense. The, the bullets are flying left and right. Nobody's nobody's standing on the front porch to a gun. So, but they say there were people who witnessed the death of Hal, and they cried out, "That was wrong. That was wrong. He's a minister." Um, and from there, the story escalates to where they tried to bring charges against the rebel soldier. That never happened. Uh, if it did happen, his defense was that the man was wearing a sidearm. That makes him a combatant. Hal stepped out, did not look like a chaplain, would not surrender, and that got him shot. Yes, Dan. John, where was he from again? In Jersey? Yes, I do remember the town. According to the uh, oh, 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 pit. according to his biographical sketch from Lafayette, from Ewing, New Jersey. There's uh, other articles just rounded off at Trenton. He was from Trenton, New Jersey. I don't know. Ewing close to Trenton. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and do we know anything about his ancestors? No, I don't know a whole lot about his ancestors. There, but there is a wonderful. Um, collection of books, uh, rather lengthy books, uh, about that I got from the uh, from the descendant. Jacqueline McGann lives over in Presque Isle Mountain Home area. She is um, she she's pretty up on that, and she gave me a portion of that book book to read, um, and so and so I read that. So I, so I read that, but that's really all, all I know. Um, I, I I didn't want to get. I didn't want to go into the ancestry too, too deeply because I wanted the story is about Horatio Howe. Did I have a dance around your question? I don't think I answered it. <laughs> Anything else? Anything at all? Well, thank you. You guys were great. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you.